All right, thank you everyone uh, for coming. Welcome to Emily Longman's exit seminar. Um, for those of you who I may have not have met, um, my name is Eric Sanford. I'm Emily's uh, PhD advisor. And I'm gonna offer just a short introduction before uh, turning it over to Emily to talk about her dissertation research. Um, Emily filed her dissertation last week and gave her exit seminar at Bodega Marine Lab. So she's now officially Dr. Emily Longman. Yep. <clears throat> So this is uh, the last stop on the uh, celebration tour, so to speak. Um, so Emily arrived in our graduate program with a really stellar academic record. She went to Brown, Uni Brown University where she graduated in 2015, uh, magna cum laude. She then went on to work as a research technician at Northeastern University with uh, Jeff Trussell, where she gained a lot of experience in field work and working um, in marine ecology. Emily arrived here at UC Davis in uh, 2017, and uh, for the past six years, she's really been a central part of my lab group. She's been a natural leader in my lab, and she's made a lot of contributions to the Dagan Marine Lab and to UC Davis and beyond. Um, I think Emily is one of the most natural field researchers that I've ever met. Um, working in the intertidal zone requires kind of a special skill set. You need to be able to be agile, walking over slippery surfaces, getting up before dawn, carrying lots of heavy gear around, um, doing lots of manual labor really quickly before the tide comes in. It's really kind of an unusual um, skill set, and Emily can uh, single-handedly do the work of three normal people. She's just um, a, a force of nature in, in the field. Um, let's see. As you'll hear about in just a minute, Emily completed a really fascinating dissertation that addresses um, questions that are really at the intersection of ecology and evolution. Um, but I just wanted to highlight uh, that, you know, completing a PhD is no easy task, right? There's, there's lots of obstacles that need to be overcome. And in Emily's case, she faced an additional major obstacle, which was a global pandemic, right? So this added a lot of extra challenges to uh, crossing the finish line, so to speak. Um, when the pandemic hit and essentially shut down the world, it just so happened that Emily was in the midst of these experiments, which required raising thousands of live tiny snails at Bodega. And so we essentially gave our entire lab space over to Emily, because of course at that point we couldn't work together. And so for months before there were vaccines, Emily um, worked in isolation at the lab doing these experiments and you know, on some days didn't encounter another person at the Marine Lab. Um, so she persevered through all of that. And despite those challenges, as you'll hear, she conducted a really ambitious set of lab experiments involving hundreds of replicates. This is just one tiny corner of her kingdom at Bodega with um, hundreds and hundreds of replicate containers. She did a really ambitious field experiment that you'll hear about. Um, and I'll just mention that Emily only has time today to talk about two of her dissertation chapters. She has a whole nother project that was this big ambitious field um, historical ecology project shown here. She also has a big genomics project that she's been doing in Rachel Bay's lab that's underway. Um, so she's accomplished a lot. Okay, and at the same time, Emily's been a really outstanding teaching assistant. So she um, taught in my summer classes at Bodega for four different summers. It's been a really exceptional mentor to lots of undergraduates um, out at Bodega, including some students that are here today, which is great. Emily's also been really active in service. She served on all kinds of committees. She was the president of the Bodega Marine Sciences Association. She's done a lot of outreach. Here she is out at um, Bodega Bay doing outreach at the local farmer's market. Uh, she also organized two public film festivals, one here on campus and one in Bodega Bay uh, to help grad students communicate their science um, to broader audiences. And she's just been an all around um, amazing team member, both on our softball team, but in general in our academic communities um, at Bodega and here on campus. So um, exit seminars are always a little bittersweet. We're sad to see Emily moving on, but we're very excited that um, this fall, she is starting a um, postdoc with Melissa Pesfeni at the University of Vermont, where she'll be doing um, ecological genomics. And that postdoc starts Wednesday. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> so 
uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Emily. Um, okay, uh, thanks, Eric. That was an uh, amazing introduction. And thank you all uh, for coming today. This is so fun. It's fun seeing a lot of students that I've taught before and fun seeing a lot of new faces, given that I'm not in Davis very often. Um, so exciting to see a lot of the new people um, in CPB. Um, so the title of my talk today is Drilling Deeper, Exploring Local Adaptation and Eco-Evolutionary Dynamics in a Rocky Shore Community. So a lot of seminal ecological research has been performed at the level of the quadrat or cage. Theories about succession, disturbance, and keystone species have all been developed using these very simple tools. And um, however, it remains unclear whether uh, studies done at these local levels of the quadrat can be extrapolated to predict how processes play out over much larger spatial scales and over longer time periods. We know that there's a lot of environmental variation present across large spatial scales that might alter ecological processes. Um, so this is a satellite image showing sea surface temperature from June, and you can see that there's quite a bit of variability in sea surface temperature across the Pacific Ocean. There's also a lot of variation in natural ecosystems through time. Uh, so as I progress um, from the summer into fall, um, you can see this warm water anomaly that's been building this fall. So in order to understand community dynamics, we really need to consider how both ecological and evolutionary processes might vary through both space and time. In addition, historically, marine ecologists have neglected the importance of evolution and structuring patterns across the scales used in most studies. And this is due to the fact that many marine organisms have planktonic larvae that were thought to disperse great distances leading to hygiene flow um, and population connectivity along the coast. But there's been a growing body of work that has shown that many marine species display patterns of restricted connectivity across the ranges um, of uh, many species due to life history, larval behavior, or oceanographic features that lead to the retention of larvae near their natal habitat. This has led to growing awareness um, of the importance of adaptive variation in marine ecosystems. And given that many species uh, display low gene flow among populations, uh, there's greater potential for natural selection to act on local populations, um, such as at the level of different rocky headlands um, shown here distributed along the coast. Um, and this can lead to patterns such as local adaptation. In addition, if pools of variation exist within populations, um, there's also the potential for selection to act on um, this variation within a population over short time scales leading to rapid adaptation. Um, so despite recent attention to these topics, um, I think there's a lot that we still don't know about adaptive variation in the ocean. Um, so with this in mind, these are the two main questions that have driven most of my dissertation research, um, which are what forces generate and maintain adaptive variation within and among marine populations? And what are the ecological consequences of this variation? So I've been interested in studying these questions across two different scales, um, with the first of which being biogeographic scales and the second um, being rapid temporal scales. So for the first half of my talk, um, I'm gonna be digging into biogeographic scales. So the geographic mosaic theory of coevolution is a framework for studying reciprocal selection of co-evolving species across a landscape. And this theory is based on the assumptions that uh, species are often collections of genetically distinct populations, um, shown here as these kind of amorphous blobs, um, and that interacting species often differ in their geographic ranges. And lastly, that species interactions often differ among environments and their ecological outcomes. So as a result of this, um, across the range of two interacting species, we have regions where coevolution is strong, or hotspots shown here in red, and regions where coevolution is weak, um, or cold spots um, shown here in blue, and there's kind of like everything in between that as well. Um, I personally find these cold spots really interesting because um, these can occur if the geographic distribution of the two interacting species are not completely aligned such that one species is absent in those regions. Or these can occur when both species are present, but additional abiotic or biotic factors alter the strength of the interaction between these two species. 
Uh, Predator-prey interactions um, are really ideal systems for studying coevolution uh, because the risk of mortality from predation or from insufficient food consumption creates really strong reciprocal selection. And many of these species interactions occur across really large spatial scales with varying biotic and abiotic forces. An example of this is in the geographic, um, or, uh, an example of the geographic mosaic theory of coevolution is in the interaction um, between toxic newts um, and uh, the Sierra Gardner snake. Um, so the left figure here is showing the level of newt toxicity across the newts range. Um, the center panel is showing the level of resistance across the snakes range. And the furthest to the right panel is showing the level of uh, phenotypic mismatch among prey and predator phenotype, um, where hot spots are in red and cold spots are in blue. Um, so the latter are situations where newt toxicity and snake resistance um, are poorly matched. So either species and these species interactions can be influenced by environmental gradients. Um, for example, prey abundance, nutritional value, and defenses can all vary spatially as a result of external forces. Um, so an example of this is in the commercial clam, um, which is shown here, which displays variation in calcification rates and growth along 400 kilometers of the Adriatic Sea as a result of variation in solar radiation, sea surface temperature, salinity, and chlorophyll concentrations. And this variation in calcification can impact their vulnerability to uh, predation. Understanding the adaptive landscape uh, that shapes species interactions also requires considering temporal variation in environmental conditions. So this landscape can shift continually through time with biotic or abiotic changes, which can differentially affect the interacting species. So these changes may shift coevolutionary hotspots to cold spots. Um, so this hotspot in the lower left um, can be switched to a cold spot or vice versa. And these changes could arise via range shifts or contraction such that the predator and prey may no longer interact in some areas. Um, or a third species may shift its range and influence the dynamics of this focal predator and prey. Alternatively, abiotic changes um, may alter the traits of a given species, which could subsequently modify how um, two species interact. And evolved differences in predator traits um, can in turn also drive strong eco-evolutionary effects in the surrounding community through both direct effects um, on prey, as well as indirect effects um, on other species. So this gets me um, to the predator-prey species interaction that I'm gonna be talking about um, for the rest of my talk. Um, so the predator in my case um, is the channel dagloth, which is the snail here in the middle, Nisala canaliculata. Um, and the prey that I'm gonna be focusing on the most um, is all of the things around it, which I, um, the California mussel, Middleist californianus. Um, so these mussels are a critical foundation species that creates very large mussel beds along the west coast of North America. These snails consume their prey by drilling a tiny hole um, through the shell of their prey. And they do so using a chemomechanical mode of feeding in which they alternate between secreting acid using their accessory boring organ and using the radula uh, to scrape away uh, this weakened shell. Nusella canaliculata lay clusters of benthic egg capsules during the spring and summer, and young snails will develop in these egg capsules and then ultimately hatch out and crawl away and establish in the surrounding area, so the species has really limited dispersal. Nusella canaliculata also live within mussel beds on very wave-exposed rocky shores, um, so populations are separated along the coast by intervening sandy beaches. Um, and previous research has shown that this species uh, displays a pattern of isolation by distance. In previous research by my advisor, Eric Sanford, um, has documented geographic variation um, in this predator-prey interaction. So Eric did this by raising snails um, from populations in both California and in Oregon in the lab through two generations on a common diet, and then tested their ability to drill mid-sized Middleist Californianus mussels. And as results from that experiment are shown here, um, where dog walks from California, uh, which are on the left-hand side of the dotted line, readily were able to drill these mid-sized mussels, while those from Oregon uh, generally could not. So this gets me to the more specific question I wanted to address in this project, which is how do spatial mosaics of selection drive adaptive differentiation among coastal populations of consumers, 
uh, specifically Nusala canaliculata. My first hypothesis for this is that Nusala canaliculata populations differ in the thickness of muscle shells um, that they can uh, drill successfully. Uh, so to do this experiment in 2019, I went to six sites, three in California and three in Oregon, and I collected sets of egg capsules. Where each set of egg capsule was laid by a single female. Um, so snails that um, hatched from that set of egg capsules were all uh, siblings, um, either full siblings or half siblings. So I called um, snails from the same set of egg capsules um, families of snails. So I brought these um, egg capsules back to Bodega Marine Lab, and I hatched them in the lab um, and reared these uh, tiny snails on a common diet of thin-shelled metallus trosselus mussels. Um, and raising tiny snails is a lot of work, um, and I couldn't have done this without the help of a former uh, UCD undergrad, Maddie. So in June of 2020, I then did a really large 25-week-long experiment where I quantified snail phenotype. Um, and I did this by identifying the largest and thickest muscle that each individual snail could drill. So I performed this experiment on 10 snails from eight families across the six populations. Um, in order to do this experiment, I took advantage of the fact that larger middle East Californianus mussels have thicker shells, um, which is shown in the figure on the top left. So I challenged uh, individual snails with a series of mussels of increasing size. So I started all of the snails at the smallest size class, and if they were able to drill a muscle of that size class, they were subsequently offered larger and thicker muscles of the next size classes. Um, and the muscles from the first six um, uh, size cl classes were from Bodega Marine Reserve. Um, and snails that progressed past um, the 150 millimeter muscle from Bodega Marine Reserve were subsequently offered a 150 and then a 170 millimeter muscle um, from Strawberry Hill, Oregon. Um, and based on preliminary data, we had assumed that these muscles from Strawberry Hill um, would be exceptionally thick and would be kind of this endpoint of this continuum. Um, so I analyzed the largest muscle drilled um, for each snail using linear mixed effects models. Um, so I have population going along the x-axis, going from south to north, from left to right. Um, and I have the largest muscle drilled along the y-axis. When I add in the data, um, you can see that these dog walk populations were really strikingly divergent in the maximum size of muscle that these snails could drill. So dog walks from California, which are the left lead populations, were capable of drilling much larger muscles than those from Oregon. Um, so the snails from Oregon were typically drilling muscles um, that were smaller than five centimeters, where those from uh, California were able to drill muscles that in some cases were at, or in some cases even superseded 150 millimeters, which are some of the largest muscles that you can find in these muscle beds. Uh, so to identify maximum drill hole depth, I took the largest several muscles um, drilled by each individual snail, and I cut these shells um, on a bandsaw through the drill holes. Um, and I chose the largest several muscles by e drilled by each individual snail um, because shell thickness varies along the kind of anterior to posterior axis um, of these muscles. So the largest muscle drill didn't always contain the deepest drill hole. I then um, took photographs um, of these uh, drill holes um, by placing these cross sections flat on a scanner, um, as you can see here, so that you can see the drill hole or partial drill hole. And then I analyzed the depth of that drill hole um, using image analysis. Um, so similar to the results um, on maximum length, um, maximum drill hole depth differed significantly among the populations. Um, so this graph is set up in a very similar fashion. Um, and what you can see is that the populations from California had the capacity to drill drill holes that were on average 4.4 times uh, deeper than those from Oregon. Um, so a really big difference among the populations. Um, so going back to my main question for this project, um, I hope I've been able to prove to you that the drilling capacity of these snails um, differs greatly along the West Coast. Um, however, this doesn't answer uh, the question of what has caused this pattern. So my second hypothesis then um, was that Nusala candelicolata populations are adapted to a consistent coastal mosaic of muscle shell thickness. So the California current is an eastern boundary upwelling system and during certain times of the year, upwelling brings really cold nutrient rich water from the deep ocean to the surface. Um, in addition, upwelling uh, generates this pretty persistent um, spatial mosaic of acidified waters in nearshore habitats. 
Um, so this figure is showing the level of pH severity for three years across much of California and Oregon. And oceanographic conditions um, can in turn influence patterns of muscle growth and shell thickness. Um, so if this spatial pattern of upwelling um, and pH has been persistent um, over long time scales, um, this may have created a spatial mosaic of muscle shell traits along the West Coast um, with effects on the evolution of the drilling capacity of uh, Nusala Kanalakalava. Uh, so I was interested in analyzing shell thickness across the same six populations. I studied um, snail phenotype. And lucky for me, um, Eric has saved lots of boxes of mussels from his previous research. Um, so I was able to analyze shell thickness across two uh, decades, with the first set of mussel shells being collected in 2000 to 2001, the second set being collected in 2008 to 2009, and then in 2019, I collected mussel shells from all of these sites. Um, so with all of those muscles, I cut the left valve of all of them at one third the length of the muscle, um, one third the length from the anterior end. Um, and I chose that region since that's the most commonly drilled region by Nusella Kandalakalata. Um, so then I scan these cross sections and then use these photos to calculate um, average thickness uh, via imaging software. So I ultimately analyzed the log of the ratio of muscle shell thickness at one third the length of the muscle to muscle length. Um, and using this ratio allowed to control for differences in the lengths of muscles um, across the um, uh, time period sampled. Um, so this is set up in a similar fashion where the California populations on the left and the Oregon populations along the right. Um, and I'm gonna walk through this slowly starting with the first time period and then subsequently adding um, data from the later time periods. Um, so in 2000 to 2001, you can see that the two central Oregon sites of Strawberry Hill and Fogarty Creek um, stand out as having the thickest muscles, while the Northern California site of Van Dam, um, shown here as VD, um, had the thinnest muscles. A very similar pattern was seen in 2008 to 2009. Um, however, in 2019, the spatial pattern has changed where the thickest muscles were still found at Strawberry Hill, um, while the thinnest muscles occurred at Fogarty Creek and Van Dam. And when you analyze each um, site separately, you can see that there are clear temporal uh, patterns of muscle thinning over time. Where muscle shells at every single site except for Sobranes Point, which is in Monterey, were thinner in 2019 um, than in 2008. And the two sites that had the greatest amount of thinning were the two central Oregon sites of Strawberry Hill and Fogarty Creek, um, which were previously the thickest sites, or had the thickest muscles. Um, and this finding is um, consistent with a lot of prior work in both California and in Washington, where researchers have compared the mineralogical composition of archival mussel shells with modern day counterparts, um, and has been able to show that ocean acidification associated with climate change is altering mussel shell growth and calcification. But the main question from my work is how these two pieces uh, of drilling capacity and shell thickness fit together. Uh, so this figure is showing the estimates of drilling capacity along the y-axis um, and shell thickness along the x-axis um, for each of the six sites for the three time periods, um, where the six sites um, in each time period corresponds to the uh, six sites. And what you can see is that for the first two time periods, uh, there's a negative relationship between snail drilling capacity and muscle shell thickness. Um, however, this pattern seems to break down in 2019. So I think these results suggest that there is spatial variation in shell thickness that has contributed to adaptive differentiation among populations of dog whelks, um, where there's this uh, spatial mosaic of shell thickness with shells being consistently thinner in California than in Oregon over time. And I think the thinner shells in California is associated with a greater drilling capacity in these dog whelk populations um, in a pattern which um, on the surface may seem somewhat counterintuitive um, however, we hypothesize um, that these thinner shells um, may have initially led um, Nusella candelicolata in California to be able to target Middleus californianus as a viable prey item. And then over time, um, selection to prey on larger mussels with uh, greater tissue um, and thicker shells has um, favored the continued evolution of greater drilling capacity in these snails. In contrast, um, we hypothesize that the thicker Middle East Californian shells in Oregon um, has dissuaded the dog walks in this region um, from preying on this species. 
In addition, um, previous research has shown that the abundance of alternate prey, um, including barnacles and thin-shelled middle astrocilus fossils, um, is much greater in Oregon than in California. And this might have further weakened uh, selection pressures on Oregon dog walk populations. So our findings are consistent with this hypothesis that the strength of selection varies with prey defenses across the overlapping ranges um, of these two species, with strong prey-driven selection on the predator in California and a coevolutionary cold spot on the central Oregon coast. Um, in addition, uh, we believe that there are ecological consequences um, for these divergent phenotypes, uh, such as this intertidal predator may serve different functional roles across its biogeographic range. Um, so we hypothesize that Nusala canaliculata may have a greater community effects in California than in Oregon. And this is due to their stronger impacts on the foundation species, Middleus californianus, and their ability to drill these really large and really old mussels. While in Oregon, Nusala canaliculata may have a smaller effect on community dynamics, um, and this is in line with a lot of prior work um, on the central Oregon coast, which has shown that dog walks um, have much weaker effects than Pisaster ochracius or the Ochra sea star, um, which is a keystone species um, on rocky shores and is known to dictate muscle bed dynamics. Um, however, this selection um, landscape appears to be changing as a result of ocean acidification, and this may impact um, uh, prey-driven selection on populations of the dog walk Nusala canaliculata. However, the capacity and rate at which uh, these Oregon populations um, might evolve to target Middle East Californianus is going to depend on the level of standing genetic variation um, present in these populations. Um, so a much greater understanding of gene flow um, in this species and population structure along the coast um, is needed to predict how this species may or may not um, adapt as conditions change. Um, so stepping back um, a little bit, um, having a really solid understanding of species life history and dispersal potential is really critical when studying interacting species across a landscape um, because mismatches and dispersal can result um, in unique selection mosaics for interacting species um, with consequences for understand understanding things such as local adaptation and eco-evolutionary dynamics. Um, so an example of this um, is a weevil uh, that preys on seeds of the Japanese um, camellia um, shown here. And this weevil has much greater uh, dispersal potential than its host plant. Um, and as a result of this, um, this weevil has led to a homogenizing effect um, that promotes the evolutionary convergence among populations of the plant. Um, in contrast, in our study system, the prey species, Middleus californianus, has really high dispersal potential and high gene flow across its geographic range. Whereas the predator, Nusala canaliculata, lacks planktonic dispersal and is really highly differentiated among sites. And I think these differences in dispersal potential and the asymmetric strength of selection pressures on predator and prey may lead to a system where spatial um, variation in prey traits, um, specifically muscle shell thickness, are environmentally driven, while low dispersal in the predator um, promotes local adaptation in consumer phenotypes um, with, in general, much broader ecological consequences for the surrounding community. Um, so jumping back to our ecological theory, um, I want to highlight again the importance of studying interacting species within a geographic context of varying environmental pressures and biotic forces. And these forces, I think, um, play an underappreciated role um, dictating um, evolutionary patterns of phenotypic divergence uh, with ecological consequences for communities, um, particularly in a rapidly changing world. Um, okay, so I want to summarize what we've covered so far. Um, so I hope I've been able to demonstrate to you um, that there's a striking mosaic of drilling capacity um, in these um, marine snails, Nusala canaliculata, and that this predator phenotype is associated with variation in muscle shell thickness. Um, however, um, uh, this selection mosaic appears to be changing as a result of ocean, ocean acidification oh, um, associated with climate change. Okay. Um, so, so far, um, we've discussed the mechanisms and consequences of adaptive variation um, across really large spatial scales and over decadal temporal scales. Um, so now we're going to switch scales here um, and begin thinking about these same two questions over rapid temporal scales.
So there's increasing awareness uh, that evolution can proceed rapidly with genetic changes occurring rapid enough to have measurable impact on simultaneous ecological change. For example, uh, previous work um, on Darwin's finches in the Galapagos Islands um, has established that periods of drought um, can change um, plant communities and therefore seed availability, which can drive the evolution of beak morphology of these finches, as well as alter population growth rates um, for finches with uh, different beak morphologies. An increased recognition that evolution can proceed rapidly has resulted in this emerging field of eco-evolutionary dynamics. So this field analyzes uh, the reciprocal impacts that ecological and evolutionary processes can have on one another on contemporary timescales. And studies in this field so far have been able to show that eco-evolutionary dynamics can influence species diversity, predator-prey cycles, uh, community structure, and the success of biological invasions. And although this field is getting a lot of attention, I think there are a lot of gaps um, in our knowledge. I think the biggest unanswered question um, is if these feedbacks are important or trivial in nature. Um, most of the experiments uh, studying eco-evolutionary dynamics so far have been performed in either a lab setting or in mesocosms. And these experiments, I think, are a really important first step um, for studying eco-evolutionary feedbacks. Um, however, I think field experiments are needed to determine whether eco-evolutionary feedbacks are swamped or amplified um, by external factors in more complex natural environments. Uh, second, I think many of the eco-evolutionary dynamics studies um, so far have generally focused on um, pairs of species um, and have seldom tested their effects at community or ecosystem levels. Also, um, most of the experimental studies of eco-evolutionary dynamics um, have generally compared uh, two or more locally adapted populations that have evolved under spatially divergent selection. Um, for example, uh, researchers have taken guppies um, from different rivers in Trinidad that have evolved under different predation regimes and then tested them in mesocosms at one location. And while these studies um, demonstrate that evolutionary processes can influence ecological dynamics, um, this approach often relies on substantial phenotypic variation um, that's evolved over decades to centuries or more um, over um, a larger spatial scale. Um, I think in contrast, um, there's been increasing calls um, for studying the dynamics of systems where there's no separation in time between the ecological and evolutionary processes under consideration. So one promising approach for studying eco-evolutionary dynamics um, is to explore whether abiotic um, and biotic variation acting over rapid timescales from uh, months to years might impose selection on existing within population variation and functional traits, uh, specifically those that have links to community dynamics. And I think the Nusala Canalicolata system um, is this ideal system for testing the community level consequences of eco-evolutionary dynamics. Um, and I think that's because this is a predator that exhibits um, substantial variation in foraging traits um, and drilling ability has been shown to have um, a, a heritable basis. And out of this um, uh, figure of Eric's I showed previously, I wanna really highlight this Bodega Marine Reserve population, which contains a mix of drilling phenotypes that seems to vary both within and among um, Nusala Canalicolata families. These snails also have a relatively fast generation time and have really high early life mortality, um, as high as 90 to 99% uh, during the first two months of life. Um, so upon hatching, these snails um, are really small um, and are dependent on a supply of newly recruited uh, prey, which are spatially and temporally variable in their abundance. In addition, um, Bodega Marine Reserve um, is located at a region along the coast, uh, which is known to have interannual variation um, in recruitment of both barnacles and mussels, as well as have variation in upwelling, um, with high variability in pH between years, um, which could result in temporal variation and muscle shell thickness. Um, so due to the substantial environmental variation at Bodega Marine Reserve and the really high early life mortality in Nusella, um, there's a potential for strong selection to occur within each generation. <laughs> 
from previous work um, studying dog walks um, uh, has shown that Nucella can alter community processes, um, specifically muscle bed succession. Um, so winter storms and really large waves um, will frequently dislodge um, muscles um, and create these disturbance gaps um, that are shown in the bottom left here um, that then go through this well-documented uh, sequence of succession going from a bare space uh, to a mix of species and then ultimately back um, to being dominated by muscles. Um, so this whole process takes somewhere between two to four years. Um, so this gets me to the focal question for this project which is how does temporal variation in selection drive eco-evolutionary dynamics in this intertidal predator prey interaction? And what are the uh, cascading community effects? So I um, hypothesize that temporal variation in prey could impose strong selection on existing within population variation in drilling phenotypes in Nucella canaliculata. And subsequently, um, that variation in drilling phenotypes um, could impact uh, muscle bed succession. So to test this hypothesis, um, I conducted a selection experiment where I reared newly hatched dog whelks um, on different prey treatments, mimicking a situation in nature where cohorts of snails um, would hatch out and encounter uh, different prey communities. Um, so I did this in the summer of 2020, where I collected 18 sets of egg capsules um, from Bodega Marine Reserve and four sets of egg capsules from Sobranes Point. Um, and similar to the last project, I'm going to uh, classify uh, sets of egg capsules um, as families um, of snails. So the population um, of Sobranes point snails um, were used as a control uh, since previous research had shown um, that uh, individual snails from this population were consistently strong drillers and had little variation among individuals. Um, so dog walks were ultimately hatched at BML. Um, and snails from each family were split among four different diet treatments for a three month long selection phase. Um, so the diet treatments uh, were a control diet of thin shelled middle uh mussels, which is what I had used um, in my previous experiment. I then had two diet treatments of middle east californianus um, coming from two different populations. And then my last diet treatment um, was acorn barnacles. So the uh, two Middle East California anus treatments um, were used to represent differences in shell thickness uh, since previous research um, had shown that adult Middle East California anus um, from uh, Bodega Marine Reserve um, had thicker shells than those from Sobranes Point. Um, and I just want to note that this color scheme is going to be used for the rest of my talk for these four diets. Um, so raising snails is a lot of work, um, again, um, and I just want to point out a few people who helped one of which is in the room um, today. Um, so after this three month long selection phase on these diet treatments, I assessed mortality um, for each family and I analyzed that data with generalized linear mix models. Um, so I'm gonna walk through this slowly because I have a lot of figures that look like this later on. Um, so I have the four uh, diet treatments along the X axis and percent mortality at the level of the family along the Y. Um, and for each uh, diet treatment, there's going to be two bars um, where the bar on the left, which is darker in color, um, is going to represent the snails from Bodega Marine Reserve. And the ones, um, the bars on the right, which are lighter in color, is going to represent the snails from Sobranes Point. Um, so mortality of dog walks varied among the diet treatments, um, with snails raised on Middle East Trostolus having the highest survival. And the snails raised on the thick shelled um, Bodega Marine Reserve Middle East California anus having the greatest mortality. And mortality did not seem to differ uh, between the two populations of snails. Um, so the two bars for each diet treatment. So after the three month long selection phase, um, I weird all of the snails out on a common diet of middle East trostolus until they were adults. Um, at which point in time, I then did a laboratory scoring experiment um, to quantify snails drilling capacity. Um, so to do this, um, I tested individual adult Nucella canaliculata on their ability to drill mid-sized Middle East California anus um, over the course of a 100-day experiment. So I gave each individual snail two five to seven centimeter long mussels um, and checked these containers every three weeks. Um, so I ultimately uh, assessed drilling capacity as a binary response of if the snails were able to drill at least one muscle, um, and I also uh, quantified the total number of muscles drilled per snail. 
Um, and due to the nested structure of the data and high level of variation uh, between the populations, um, I ran Bayesian hierarchical models um, to analyze this data. Um, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to show the binary um, drilling data because the total number of muscles drilled um, shows a really similar pattern. Um, so this graph is set up in a very similar fashion. Um, and I have the proportion of snails um, at the level of the family um, being shown along the y-axis, um, but the stats were run on individual level data. Um, and what you can see is that the dog walks from sober on A's point, which are the white bars um, for each diet treatment, had a much higher frequency um, of successful drilling um, than those from Bodega Marine Reserve. Um, and this is not surprising um, given pre previous research. Um, but what is interesting is that early life diet did not seem to impact the drilling ability of these snails. Um, what was really interesting is that early life diet um, uh, did have substantial effects on the percentage of the surviving snails uh, from Bodega Marine Reserve, um, which were strong drillers. Um, so drilling success was highest um, for those uh, Bodega Marine Reserve snails that were raised on the BMR Middle East California anus treatment, um, which are shown here in the dark red. And as a reminder, those were the snails that had the highest early life mortality. Um, so, so far I've been able to show um, that early life mortality um, or early life diet results in differential mortality um, that affected the drilling ability of these adult um, dog walks. Um, but the second piece of this is closing um, this loop and testing the ecological consequences of these divergent phenotypes. Um, so to do this, I did a field outplant experiment um, where I assessed whether variation in drilling phenotypes uh, would impact muscle bed succession. And I predicted um, that dog whelks would slow succession um, compared to plots where dog whelks would be excluded. And I also predicted uh, that dog whelks with a greater proportion of strong drilling phenotypes, um, which was shown to be the snails that were raised on the BMR Middle East California anus treatment in our lab experiment, um, would drill larger and more muscles and would ultimately slow the progression of succession. So to do this in May of 2020, I went out and cleared 16 um, large intertidal um, regions at Muscle Point. And I let these communities develop uh, naturally for a year uh, until the plots contain a mid-successional community. Um, so in May of 2021, um, I went out and I installed stainless steel mesh cages uh, with removable lids into each of these um, 16 regions. Uh, so the cages were in a block design um, where five cages were being placed within each of the 16 regions. Um, and each block re represented snails from the same family, um, with each cage randomly being assigned um, to contain snails of one of the four diet treatments. Um, plus there's one cage um, that was assigned to be a reference cage that didn't get any dog walks. Um, so if I take off the lid on one of these cages, um, you can see that the start of this experiment, um, these plots were at a mid-successional stage, which means that they had a mix of acorn barnacles, gooseneck barnacles, and a few small mussels in there. And I chose this stage um, to start my experiment because I thought this was the point in time that these snails would have the largest impact on the trajectory of muscle bed succession. So in July of 2021, um, I went out and outplanted five adult dog walks um, from each of the 16 um, Bodega Marine Reserve family by diet treatments and placed these in each of the uh, cages. And then every eight weeks uh, for the next year, um, I would go out, I would remove the lids and photograph the plots to assess percent cover of sessile species. Um, so this is just the progression of one cage um, through time. So you can see that over the course of the year, succession happened um, and went from this mid-successional stage to being, in many cases, completely dominated by mussels. Um, so for the percent cover analyses, I ultimately grouped species um, into seven functional groups. Um, and I just want to point out um, two former UCD undergrads, um, Anna and Jackie, who were really helpful on this project. Um, so I analyzed the percent cover data using non-metric multidimensional scaling ordinations and Permanova. Um, so I visualized the NMDS graphs uh, for each experimental check, um, with this figure being the community composition right before I outplanted the snails. Um, so each dot is representing the community composition based on those seven functional groups uh, present within a given cage. Um, and the color represents um, the treatment with gray being the reference cages, um, so the cages that didn't get any dog walks, 
um, and the four colors um, representing the early life diet treatments um, of the snails that were placed in those cages. Um, and the ellipses are the 95% confidence ellipses. Um, so this ornation graph, given that this is right before I outplanted the snails, um, ultimately is showing that the community composition didn't differ. Everything's all on top of each other. Um, so these are the ornation graphs through time. And you can see that over time, um, all of the dots and ellipses ultimately move to kind of like the muscle section um, of the graph, which just highlights um, uh, the progression of succession. Um, and over the course of the year, the trajectory of succession diverged most strongly um, for the reference cages um, where there were no dog walks, which are the gray ellipses. Uh, but the big question um, was how the different colored ellipses differ. Um, and going back um, to our predictions, we would predict um, that the red ellipses um, that represented the snails that were raised on the BMR Middleist Californianus um, early in life, which had the highest early life mortality um, and diverged most strongly in the lab um, with slow succession. And although there were some differences in community composition um, among the treatments um, uh, with snails, there was substantial overlap um, and no clear differences in the trajectory of succession. Um, so to identify uh, differences among treatments, um, I ran follow-up univariate models on each of the seven functional groups. Um, so to keep things brief, this is just um, uh, the graph of the muscles, um, since muscles represented the end stage of succession. Um, and so I have time along the x-axis here and percent cover of muscles along the y. And you can see that the reference cage had a lot more muscles. Um, while the um, key point though is that the um, uh, red diet treatment, um, which represented those snails based on the BMR Middleist Californianus, um, those snails um, or that treatment do not differ um, compared to the other uh, dog walk treatments. So at the end of the experiment, I collected all of the organisms living within the cage um, and counted um, and measured all of those muscles. Um, so at the end of the field experiment, the number of live muscles within these cages um, differed among the treatments. Um, but the only thing that really stood out um, is that uh, the reference cage where there were no dog walks um, contained many more muscles um, than the other treatments. So jumping back um, to our question of if there are eco-revolutionary dynamics in the system. So despite us finding differential mortality um, among the diet treatment, suggesting the potential for selection, uh, and the fact that we saw differences in the drilling capacity in the lab, uh, eco-revolutionary dynamics um, or feedbacks were relatively weak um, when tested um, in this field setting. And I don't think this is an artifact of just our system. Um, I think there are a number of factors that may have driven this finding. And I think many of these factors likely apply much more broadly um, to other systems. Uh, so I think eco-revolutionary feedbacks are often swamped in the field uh, by the overriding effects um, of substantial spatial variation and environmental uh, conditions. So on rocky shores, um, there's fine scale spatial patterns such as wave exposure and recruitment um, often vary over really small spatial scales and that may affect the rate of succession. So I think against this backdrop of substantial variation in environmental drivers, um, the influence of uh, intra-population variation in drilling traits on succession may be uh, comparatively minor. Second, um, given that um, our focus for this project was having no separation in time between ecological and evolutionary processes, uh, we focus on the variation present within one population. Um, however, there was likely a limited range of within population variation, um, especially when you compare that to what's found across uh, populations. Um, so this figure um, is a common garden um, experiment that um, I showed previously from Eric's experiments. And the focal population of Bodega Marine Reserve um, does contain um, a mix of snails with stronger and weaker uh, drilling phenotypes. Um, but that range of phenotypic variation is much less extreme um, than that found across um, the geographic range of the species. And so far, um, many of the experiments uh, that test eco-evolutionary dynamics um, have compared the effects of locally adapted populations um, or divergent ecotypes. And a very similar approach um, has been taken um, in the fields of plant community genetics, um, where plants um, are frequently uh, collected, 
um, all the way over here from distant diverge uh, phenotypes or distant diverge populations. Um, and their effects um, on insect communities are ultimately um, assessed um, in a common garden, so a much smaller spatial scale. And I think uh, these approaches often create this mismatch in spatial scales um, when used to test the relative importance of environmental versus uh, genetic influences on community processes. And lastly, um, eco-revolutionary feedbacks um, might be weaker than expected in nature um, if selection on a population is not strong enough uh, to produce really extreme divergence in functional traits. Um, so just the existence of wild populations that are comprised of phenotypically uh, diverse individuals uh, suggests that past selection has not been strong enough uh, to eliminate variation um, in traits under these more realistic selection regimes. Um, so even when there's substantial um, uh, selection, like the selection that we performed um, in our experiment, um, there were likely some strong drillers that were present um, in all of the diet treatments. And I think the maintenance um, of this variability um, likely dampened um, uh, eco-evolutionary effects in uh, this community, and I think is likely common um, in many other natural systems. Um, so circling back um, uh, to my main question from this section, um, despite um, evidence that early life diet treatments um, generated divergence um, in drilling traits, um, the effects of these feedbacks on community dynamics um, in the field were relatively weak. Um, and I think uh, this uh, likely applies much more broadly, where there are a number of factors and constraints um, that likely dampen the strength of eco-evolutionary dynamics in uh, natural communities. All right, um, so I just wanna take the time to summarize um, what we've covered today. Um, so the first half of my talk um, focused on how there's striking spatial variation um, in a predator trait, which is correlated um, with a prey trait that varies um, all along an environmental gradient. The second half of my talk um, uh, covered how selection on early life diets um, shapes the dog walk drilling capacity, um, but when tested in the field, um, these phenotypes did not impact the trajectory of succession, um, suggesting that eco-evolutionary feedbacks um, may sometimes uh, be dampened in natural communities. And more broadly, um, I think my dissertation highlights the uh, importance of studying species interactions um, in a broad ecological and evolutionary context, um, especially when thinking of natural communities in this era of climate change. All right. Um, and with that, I'll thank my funding resources. I'm doing a much shorter acknowledgement than what I did at BML, if people saw some of this. Um, so funding, um, I want to thank my advisor, Eric Sanford. Um, Eric's an amazing uh, naturalist, if you don't know him. Um, and you should definitely come out um, to the marine lab. Um, he can tell you about almost every single organism um, in um, the field um, and inspires just a lot of curiosity about the natural world and has been a really great advisor over the last several years. Um, I want to thank my dissertation committee. Um, Jay's made me think much more broadly about my work um, and put my work in a much um, kind of more general, um, uh, broader um, uh, community ecology theory um, kind of context. Um, and Rachel's been incredibly helpful. Um, I came in and did a whole genomics project in her lab, and I learned a lot from both her um, and her lab manager, Brenda, on this whole project, which took a long time and didn't end up getting into my dissertation, but it's all gonna be really helpful for my postdoc, which was really amazing. Um, I wanna thank a lot of the people who helped in the lab in the field. I think I got all of the people on here. Um, these are really big experiments um, and I couldn't have done this uh, without the help of a lot of um, undergrads, grad students and friends. I wanna thank a lot of friends. The BML community um, is really small and tight knit um, and they've been a really nice community for the past um, several years. Um, in the Sanford lab, especially Sam and Kira um, have been really great lab mates. Um, and if you liked my talk, Kira is actually giving her QE talk next week um, in the seminar series. So you can come back and hear um, about more inner title um, in parts. Um, I wanna thank my family, um, many of them who had just come out uh, for this past week, um, given that I gave a seminar um, at BML. Um, they've been really supportive um, of uh, kind of my passion and moving cross country for a PhD and that sort of thing. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I'll lastly thank um, my husband who I met, um, who um, partway through I met him in grad school and he's been so supportive and 
really helpful, um, both in the field. Um, uh, uh, he's been a great field buddy. Um, he's one of the only people that I can force to wake up at four in the morning um, to go out into the field. Um, so I definitely appreciate that. Um, as well as also a shout out um, to my dog, uh, our dog Wilson, um, who's shown there. Um, uh, he's been um, very fun and needed during especially the end of my PhD with writing. Um, golden retrievers are very lovable and they give you a lot of puppy dog looks, which convince you to stop writing. Um, and questions? Yeah, so um, a, a lot of things eat mussels. Um, they're super common out there. Um, I mean, mussel beds just like cover the entire um, box. Um, so there are tons of predators. Actually, many of the predators that eat um, mussels will also eat snails like uh, uh, okra sea stars, pisaster, um, as well as like crabs and that sort of thing. Um, so if you saw Isabel's talk, um, uh, who is also in my cohort uh, last spring, she actually took some of my snails and looked at the predators of my snails and thought of them more as that kind of like intermediate um, uh, predator. Yeah. And then I would also want to be clear, when you're in this um, so I was controlling for, um, depends on which case, there were many of them, but um, I'll, in many cases I was controlling for families of snails because um, I was thinking uh, individuals from the same cluster um, uh, or a capsule cluster could be more similar. Um, and then I also included um, some other variables in terms of experimental setup and that sort of a thing um, or tidal height of cages and those sort of things. So lots of different things. Yeah, Carol. Um, um yes so they will occasionally um so i actually would love to do uh really good behavioral comparison and optimal foraging. But these snails, especially in the like first half of my talk, um, I gave them these snails that I would think would be the biggest challenge for them. Um, and sometimes given that they had the snail for, or the mussel for a really long time, um, they would start kind of on the thicker side and then they'd end up kind of giving up after a while, they'd go somewhere else and then go somewhere else. And then finally at some point get through on the thinner side. Um, but in nature, um, in the field, um, they most often drill at this um, kind of spot that's one third um, uh, from the anterior end. Um, and Eric's actually done an experiment before where he flipped the muscle bed over in the field. Um, and then they started drilling the other side. So these snails live pretty deep down within the muscle bed. You have to kind of like move muscles out of the way and then they're deep down there. And so they're trying to kind of like hide away from um, uh, the waves and other predators and that sort of a thing. Um, so they will drill other areas um, and I've wanted to do some sort of comparisons. Um, and uh, undergrad did do a project um, kind of comparing the different populations and showed that um, the ones from California, the, the good drillers just kind of drill right away wherever and the Oregon ones kind of crawl around a long time if they're given a choice of ones to try to find um, a good muscle that they can drill. Um, so yeah. So I'm wondering if you know what the morphological or functional morphological basis of drilling ability is. That's a great question. Um, it's really hard to observe. Um, uh, they go back and forth between um, secreting acid from their accessory boring organ and then using the radula, which is this giant conveyor belt of teeth, um, both of which are really hard to physically observe as they're drilling because they're like very much so pressed against um, uh, the muscle or whatever prey they're eating. Um, so I'm actually hoping to get at that um, kind of from the opposite end of genomics. Um, so I did, yeah, both a genomics project um, here that took a long time to sequence um, the snail for some reason. They're very mucousy and had been very challenging, but I'm uh, hoping to do that um, as a kind of carrying over from um, a project here and then also going into my postdoc to try to look at it from um, 
kind of the genomic um, angle. Do you have an intuition about whether the chemistry or the gradual is more important? Um, so we think potentially it's more the accessory boring organ. And I think it could be the like length of the accessory boring organ of how long um, that can like push that into um, it. But it could be a mix of things that could be the strength of the radula or the composition of the acid. Um, so that's just kind of based off of somewhat other work that people had done, but it's really hard to get at that actually from um, a kind of very visual um, or measurable um, sort of way, but yeah. Um, I was curious in your first experiment when you're doing analyses on um, your like thickness of shell, um, you mentioned how they kind of consistently go towards that like one third away from the anterior end. So I was curious why in your analyses you chose to scale it also by the length of the shell, um, if like they consistently go to like that one part. Yeah, so um, as muscles get bigger, they're gonna get much thicker. Um, so the really, really big muscles, like I was comparing ones that were like this big to like muscles that were also this big. Um, so just the thickness is gonna vary um, uh, kind of with the muscle size. And when they get really big, they're gonna get a lot thicker. Um, so I was just trying to control for that. Um, uh, idea that the bigger muscles um, themselves are going to be bigger. Um, and because I was doing over multiple um, time periods and I didn't collect all of the muscle shells, Eric, I collected some of them um, from his uh, previous work. Um, I didn't want to bias the fact that some of the collections had either like a narrower window um, of the muscle sizes collected, um, or if some populations only had really big muscles that were collected for some reason, um, uh, if I had just looked at that thickness, um, if those populations had really big muscles, it would just happen to look like they're a lot thicker, even though they're actually not, um, which is why I kind of controlled for that. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. Okay. Anyone have to have a question? Okay.